oceans produce half of the oxygen on the planet. Start and end there, every other breath. 845 million people on the planet are gonna be closer to diseases associated with malnutrition. 90% of the livable space on our planet is oceans. Trillions of dollars in assets come out of what we harvest from the seas. We have to engage the exciting power of technology to fix problems in the oceans. If we can't do that successfully, we're not gonna be able to hang on to this ecosystem that is just so vital for the future of our planet. Go, go, go. Go get it, find one. Finney, I think I saw some down this way. My name is Douglas McCauley. I'm a professor of marine biology at UC Santa Barbara. I grew up in LA, and um, I've always been interested in the oceans. Yeah. Two, three, three. Wee! <laughs> My earliest memories as a kid are playing around in the tide pools and trying to figure out how this grand, amazing, old, but really unknown ecosystem that's so important for our planet, how it works. Let's see if we can find any sea creatures, because this is like an apartment complex for all the little animals in the ocean. Uh, anyone living in here? I see a worm. Do you see the worm in there? What I've been trained to do is understand how systems or networks work in the ocean. Hey, look at this guy. The same way that you would understand like a social network or a network on a computer chip and how they're all sort of wired together. I do that, but underwater with living networks. Bye bye. Come on, guys. Would you ever go on a journey if you could sit on the back of the whale and go way out into the ocean, Finney? Yeah. I saw these systems, intricate, beautiful, complex um, networks changing because of us. You know, the moment for me that was just this sort of personal moment that I really realized that more was needed was I took Finn um, out to visit some of these coral reefs and he's just blown away. You know, he's seeing this world that's so colorful and so full of life. It, it was special uh, just to see a part of the planet I fell in love with, to see him falling in love with it. But at the same time, I knew that um, the reef that he was swimming on was 50% dead. 50% of the reef had bleached since the time that I was studying that reef, just as a student, just a handful of years ago. And for me, like, knowing that, um, just knowing that I was passing on a system that was 50% dead to my kids, like, you know, that, 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 um, that was just not the legacy that I wanted to leave. So the grand challenge, I think, for a lot of us in marine science is being open and brave enough to have conversations with new people in the technology world. I evolved as a scientist and really sort of refocused to figure out how to embrace that same power of technology to track vessels, process new big data from sensors that are roaming in the oceans, look down and, and see whales from outer space to help fix some of these issues that are so vital to the future of our oceans. We're in Ventura Harbor here. We're getting ready to get out on the water. We're gonna cross the Santa Barbara Channel, get over to the Channel Islands into the National Park and make our first set of the dives for the day. Morning. We're gonna get a chance to do a bit of research and, and actually see firsthand the special biodiversity, special marine life that is there in this protected area. The problem in the oceans is that you don't usually see the things that are right there in your backyard just because it's this huge expanse of, uh, of veiled life. Anything that happens below the water stays below the water, at least in terms of like what we can see. Historically, mining in the oceans wasn't a thing. Now it's actually not science fiction, it's science. We're sending 300-ton waterproof robots down to the deepest sections of the oceans to grind them up, to get uh, rare earth elements, to get gold, to get copper, um, other precious metals. 
and it's a big thing. I mean, we're talking about, in the case of mining, over a million square kilometers that have been zoned into these mining claim areas. It's a section in the center of the Pacific that is uh, just about as wide as the continental US. As you can imagine, pretty bad news for the very old marine life that lives in these deep sea sections. In fact, over 50% of the species that have been discovered in some of these mining claim areas are brand new to science. So we created this project called Deep Sea Mining Watch, which is like a transparency site for deep sea mining, like a watchdog site so that you, I, your neighbor can track where this exploration for seabed mining and this, this mineral extraction in the oceans is happening. We actually take sensor data from all vessels that are transiting the oceans. We process it using an algorithm that helps detect the special signature of mining exploration. And we pull out those cases. We publish them publicly so anyone can zoom in and say, oh, OK, this is a no-go area for mining because there's just too much unique life down there and we just um, we just can't afford to mine that So out there is one of the large container ships that's coming across this ocean highway out here. There's the shipping lane that cuts right across to the Santa Barbara Channel. Just like you have a problem with roadkill on land, you have a problem with roadkill at sea too. So you have these big container ships, and they just don't have the view. They don't have the vantage point to see whales, so they run right over them. You get this, a big whale right, right around the bow of one of these ships, and it's a problem that uh, is really severe when you have an endangered whale that's really quite rare. This is a great example where technology can step in and do something. We're putting in what is the first real-time system for detecting whales in that same space. So we're using thermal sensors that look at the heat signature so you can actually you know, use these thermal cameras to actually pick up the hot um, bodies and the hot breasts of a warm-blooded whale. There's an acoustic sensor that's listening for whales. And then the third sensing modality here is, is satellites, telling us what's going on, where are productive spots, what's temperature, how all these things align to help predict where whales are likely to be. It's like weather forecasting, but weather forecasting for whales. So we take all of that information, we stick it together, and it just creates a simple alert. So we tell the ships, keep doing business, but today there are whales in this space, and so slow down, please. And when they slow down, they actually have a much lower probability of running those over these whales. There's a lot of tools in our toolbox for looking after oceans. About 2% of our oceans is closed completely to harvest. That means that 98% of our oceans is, is like uh, Hunger Games for underwater life, right? And so we need to be working with governments, working with policy to increase the number of protected areas. In our lab, we've been tracking sharks. I just wanted to learn where these sharks are feeding and where they are moving. One of the things we learned, though, is that this particular species of shark actually was wandering much further from these coral reefs than we ever anticipated. This data, all of the, the colored data, are fishing vessels. So because we're tracking the fishermen and tracking the fish, we can actually mix the story of these two apex predators out in the ocean. Then we had this moment where, in the last administration here in the United States, they had in mind setting up a protected area out in Hawaii. And we can tell you that the boundaries set up right now are too small. And the government listened, and they sat down and said, OK, if science is saying you need to move this boundary, we'll do that. And so we created the world's largest protected area. And to sort of see this all start as a journey with a simple tag stuck to a reef shark, to transit all the way up to the White House, was just really inspirational. For me, stewardship for the oceans is protecting all the things that we need from that space. It's protecting inspirations, that starfish that you show your kid and they're like, whoa, what is that funny looking thing? That's an important intrinsic and tangible value that comes from the oceans that really needs to be looked after.
Understanding how important oceans are for our fate is a gauntlet I'd like to throw down. Technology is like a yin and a yang, or it's a blessing and a curse. The science that I do can't it be any longer something where we're just out there with duct tape and zip ties. There's a, a lot of need to embrace technologies and draw them into what we do more. For scientists to get involved and in using the creativity to come up with a hyper high IQ solution. What we do to the oceans is going to dictate what happens to our species, to our place on the planets. We can't forget it.